I am so glad you convinced me that the family car should be the Defender 110. It is so beautiful inside. It's so comfortable, and it just feels indestructible. Yes, it really is. I've been waiting a long time for the new model to come out. The Defender 110, I'm telling you, it's my favorite car of all times. It's my third one. You know, I have stories of going off-road. The guy managed the group. He was like, what are you doing in this beautiful car? I'm like, I'm going off-road. He's like, are you sure? Because you can use one of ours, and then they look like Mad Max cars. I'm like, no, 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 no. we're going to do this. And he was shocked. Wow. Well, it's great because the Defender has been reimagined for 21st century adventure and its unparalleled off-road ability, as well as its robust interior, are invaluable whether you're headed towards uncharted territory or just a weekend of exploration. The Defender 110 tackles challenging surroundings with absolute confidence. The SUV conveys strength outside and in, featuring peerless technology like an intuitive driver display and an award-winning infotainment system. That's my favorite part, to keep you connected no matter where the journey takes you. Adventure is unique to everyone, and so is the Defender. Choose from the two-door Defender 90, the four-door Defender 110, or the larger Defender 130 with the ability to seat up to eight passengers. You'll find uncompromising performance in all three. So pack up and go even further with the Defender 110. Learn more at LandRoverUSA.com forward slash Defender. These days, we're all investors. Trying to be smart with our money despite our worst impulses. But at iShares, we believe that deep down inside of every investor is a better investor. One that's just waiting to be let out. Explore iShares ETFs and insights and let your best investor out. Visit iShares.com for more information. This isn't your average business podcast, and he's not your average host. This is The James Altucher Show. Today on The James Altucher Show. First, it started as an online prescription network. Maybe legal, maybe not. Then it got into more and more illegal drugs until finally this guy, Paul LaRue, was dealing with drug cartels everywhere. And then it got even more illegal with murder, arms trafficking to Iran, and much more. Here to tell the tale is the guy who wrote the book on it. It's called The Mastermind. Here's Evan Ratliff. Plus, he's got some pretty wild stories of his own. This is the first time we're talking to each other, uh, but let's get right into it. Jay tells me you have this pet theory on Twitter that you think Twitter's a Ponzi scheme. Yeah, it's probably more right to say pyramid scheme. And I, I probably shouldn't share this because I want to write it up at some point. But anyway, it's not like the most novel theory in the world. But I used to love Twitter. Everyone has, you know, everyone knows what's happened with Twitter and uh, everyone has opinions about it. But I have this particular theory that it's a, it's a pyramid scheme in that if you think about it, like what you input what you deposit is your attention and uh i would say your dignity <laughs> uh in many cases and then what you're expected to get as a return is usually attention like a greater amount of attention so it's like you're investing in the pyramid scheme but if you put your money in then eventually you will get this large amount of money and you have these people who have succeeded in doing that they have hundreds of thousands or millions of followers some of them started out very small and they just worked their way up. And you look at them the same way that if you were in, say, Amway, I don't know if you're familiar with Amway, but there are these like double diamond people who have are so high up on Amway that you look at them and they even have meetings at their house and it persuades you that you can be them. But in fact, they only exist because of you. The only reason that they have millions of followers on Twitter is that they keep attracting new people to join the platform to give away small bits of their attention in exchange for, in the end, nothing. And one last yeah. thing I'll add is if you withdraw, you can withdraw. You can say, I'm not going to be there anymore. And all your investment is lost. Same, exactly like a pyramid scheme. Like, sure, you can get out, but everything you've put into it. So there's a very strong incentive. You have sunk costs to just stay in, even when you look around and you say, oh, actually, I'm not getting anything out of this. No, it's really true. And I admit, like, 
for years and years, I was really focused on building my Twitter following. I even used to do these Q and A sessions. Like every Thursday, I would have what I called office hours. I did this for like five years, mm -hmm. and 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 that built to Twitter following. Every article I would write in the middle of the article, please follow me on Twitter and the link. So I participated in exactly what you're doing. The one thing I would say is a little different in a pyramid scheme, like an Amway, everybody involved, every single person needs to keep building the tree. They need to build their leaves. You know, the, the people who follow them, but on Twitter, not everybody is, some people are interested in just following good accounts. Not everybody is interested in being followed, but in, in Amway, everybody's interested in being followed. You can't join Amway without having people to sell to. Yeah. Yeah. There's a consumer, like if you're just on there to get information or to hear what interesting people have to say, I just feel like over time, that aspect of it has become eroded in the sort of like outrage driven general atmosphere of Twitter. But you're, you're right. I mean, yeah. I guess those people would be more equivalent to the people who buy Amway stuff. It's like there, there are people out there who's like, this Amway stuff is great. I just want to buy it. And I don't really want to be part of the scheme. But for the people who are in the scheme, it's a process of trying to work your way higher up into the levels. I agree. And I don't know if it's like an age thing or the fact that I've in various forms, I've received also an enormous amount of hate on Twitter, depending on whatever the latest article is, where I've just kind of lost interest recently. Like I can't get myself. And this is like a new thing for me. Like for 15 years, I would try to build followers on Twitter. And then just in the past year or so, even posting on Twitter, I feel like, why am I even doing this? It's so obvious I'm only posting because I want a bunch of random strangers to like me. And it feels, and then everybody could see that bullshitness of it. And it just feels bad. So I, something switched in me. I don't know what it is. Yeah, I, <laughs> it could be. It could be. I think it's also, I mean, I think it's curdled a little bit in general. And it's tipped over to where the once the negativity surpasses the the positivity, then people start to reevaluate. You know, some people are so in, hooked onto it that like that that doesn't bother them. But I think for other people, you know, you start to think like, why am I spending all day on this or at least part of my day on this? And what is it? Yeah. It, the moment you do, you know, for some people, it is still worth it. And there's still like benefits to it for sure. Twitter usage on the positive side has evolved a little. Like, yes, it's a big echo chamber where people argue nonstop uh, from the different sides. But every now and then there's, I've seen a lot more people doing Twitter threads. Like, so I was doing Twitter threads like five, six, seven years ago. But now I see it's like a regular thing people do. And the popular threads build lots of followers. And there's some value there. You know, it's odd that a platform for only, you know, 280 characters actually becomes a great platform for long form content in these threads. But, you know, that that's interesting. That's that's a positive development on Twitter. It's interesting too with the whole Elon Musk thing. You know, I wrote an article like various ways Elon Musk could improve Twitter. But I also kind of thought from the beginning he was just going to lose interest. This seems like the type of thing like it's a to it's like a, a kid giving a kid a drum set. He really wants that drum set, but then he stops playing it after the first day. <laughs> Yeah, or maybe uh, maybe a, a dog. Like a, a, you realize you have to feed it. You realize it. It you know you have to take it out for walks and like it actually has a real yeah, existence like a that you have to deal with. <laughs> <laughs> so wait, but you you did go. You came up with a fascinating project a few years ago. Where to my eyes, part of the purpose was cultivating a social media following, and I, I give you credit for it. This was a brilliant thing, and I want to talk about this a little first. Your article vanished. You you wrote for Wired magazine, and you did this thing where you went off the grid, but you were still communicating on social media, and everybody had to find you. Like, to, to describe that experiment a little more, because I, I think that was brilliant. Thank you. Yeah. That, so that originated out of um, an idea that I was pursuing for a long time, where I wanted to write about people who fake their own death. That was my initial interest, and it's a thing that's it's actually quite difficult to write about in a long form, interesting way, because most of the people who fake their own death that you hear about have failed. Otherwise that you wouldn't know about them. They would be off in their new identity. So my idea was, okay, what if I tried some version of that for a shorter period of time and we had a lot of discussions with my editor at Wired about that. And then the finding me part came in because it actually wasn't interesting. It's not interesting to sort of go off the grid and adopt a new identity if no one's looking for you. Like anyone could do that. Right. So it was trying to create some kind of tension where, oh, if people are actually looking for you, how hard is it to do this? And how hard is it for people to 
dig up information about you. Now, this was in 2009. Social media was still like in its relative infancy, like Twitter wasn't that big of a thing. And so what happened was people started organizing on Twitter. I mean, I was actually on there under my new identity and I dropped everything in my old life. And I'd gone off around the country trying to find a new place to live under a new name and all this kind of stuff. And people began organizing on social media to try to pick up clues and figure out where I was and chase me all over the country and eventually found me. And it's interesting to look back now because it's more than 10 years later. And a lot of the things that happened there were really like precursors for things that later became much, much bigger on social media and in terms of privacy and what can be found out about you and doxing and all this kind of stuff. Well, let, let's unpack that a little. Like, first off, what what tech, like, obviously you have to give, like, it seems to me if I just like held up in some hotel room and didn't tweet, then no one's going to find me as long as I can stay in that hotel room, I would think. Yeah. So like, what did you do to make it like interesting? Like, what, what, what did you, how did you hide yourself? How did you leave clues? Like, what, what was happening? Yeah, part of it was we tried to create some rules around it because it was going to be a confined period of time. So yeah, you're absolutely right. If you had one month and you could just go camp in a national park and no one would find you, just don't use your cell phone. But if, say, it was more meant to simulate if, you know, you, let's say, committed insurance fraud or something and faked your own death and you try to disappear and there's a PI looking for, like a private investigator looking for you. So that means if you really want to stay hidden, you can't use your credit cards. You cannot be doing things under your real name. You can't be calling people that you know. Those are all things that people get caught for very routinely if they fake their own death. So we created some rules for me about what I could do and that also my information would sort of be spilled out over the internet. So my editor had access to all my credit cards, for instance, my bank accounts. So if I conducted an ATM transaction, just as a very savvy investigator or an investigator with subpoenas would be able to figure that out, my editor would post that online. So everyone could see, oh, he just took $100 out of an ATM in Los Angeles. He was obviously there at 12.01 last night. That created this sort of like gamification of my situation where people would take those clues and then try to piece together where I was, where I had gone, what these things meant. So in some cases, like I would intentionally take money of an ATM when I was about to leave LA because that would get everyone focused on LA. And then I hitched a ride out of LA across the country with a band that I found on Craigslist. So it was kind of like I was trying to simulate something rather than just trying to hide and win. I was trying to simulate something, which was like someone really trying to abandon their old life when a lot of people who are pretty well resourced are trying to find you. Yeah, like if someone's trying, like you ever read this book that was out like 60 years ago or 50 years ago, How to Disappear Completely and Never Be Found? I don't know if I read that specific one, but I've read a similar versions of that. Yeah. I read this like when I was a kid and this guy kept running into people, oddly, that had you know, it was the whole thing where they would like find someone who was born on the same day as them, but they died, <laughs> the baby died. So they would get the birth certificate and then they would use that to get the social security number and they'd use that to get credit cards. And eventually they saved money and then they would do this. It was always men and they would do this to get away from their like wives and kids. And so this guy wrote a whole book about it and all, all the techniques. But like, what would you do if you were going to try to disappear completely and you can't use your credit cards? Like, what would you do now in today's day and age? Well, that's the hardest thing. I mean, that's one of the things I discovered. The hardest aspect of trying to intentionally disappear is just money. Like, what are you going to do about money? Because if you're doing it at the spur of the moment, this is what happens to a lot of people who fake their death is they usually they commit some crime or they get in trouble for this or that or some Ponzi scheme that they're running is about to collapse. And then on the, the spur of the moment, they're like, okay, I'm adopting a new identity. But if they don't have money set up somewhere, you either have to start get a job with your new identity and try to figure out how you're going to make your way, or you have to have stashed money already. Now, cryptocurrency is like arguably the way to do that now. But of course, you have to be decently savvy at it. You know, people, there's many people who believe that it's anonymous and it's, uh, it's, it's pseudo anonymous. And so you could set up, if you're good, you could probably set up money somewhere that you could later access somewhere else, but it's no easy thing to get it back out in cash. And you really have to figure out how are you going to survive if you suddenly sever yourself from all means of accessing your money or making more money. 
And I, that's where most people fall down is they, they end up accessing their bank account or try to figure out some way to get their money and then they get caught. I guess just brainstorming it. First, I would set up a company that had a, and an income stream for that company, like pretend like I know what I'm doing about, about that and not let anyone know about that. And then when I'm planning the, to, to leave, I probably wouldn't live a fancy lifestyle. I would just move into some like crappy apartment in the middle of nowhere and just try to live off the simple income stream I had generated from this shell company. Yeah. That's a good move. Like I mean, no one's going to look for me like in Kansas City or well, Oklahoma. You th you th it depends on what you've done, of course. It depends on who's looking for you. Like I, I got a cheap apartment in New Orleans in, during, during this Wired, uh, Wired story. So I got a, a, like a cheap, very cheap apartment in New Orleans. And I was starting to like get work, like running, con like doing concessions, like, you know, basic like service stuff under this like new name. Um, and like that's a cash business. Yes. I mean... But that 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 was my hope was that I could get I could do that without having to give over like a social security number or whatever. Of course, I only had to do it for a month, so it was really the tail end that I was doing that part. And now we're moving towards a cashless society, so it's even like harder to do this. I think so. So much more is digitized, both in what you would try to do, but also so much more of your identity is digitized to begin with. So it's just much easier to discover things about you that could then be used to find you. And that was part of my vanishing also was that, you know, there are aspects to my personality, things I'm interested in, like US soccer. And, you know, if I tried to live those out and say, go to US soccer game, which I did, you know, there were people there looking for me because they knew that's something that I was into. So that aspect of it now, it's just so much easier to build a profile of what someone is like, and you'd have to shed that whole profile. Did anyone use clues that they did not get from your editor? Like, did anyone find interesting stuff that you were surprised they found? Well, at the time it was surprising. I don't know if people would be surprised now because people may be a little more privacy savvy. I'm not positive that's true, but let's say they are. I mean, within one day, people had published every address I'd ever lived at, my social security number, my signature. And I, I wasn't uh. even a particularly like super online person at that time. It's 2009. So they were able to find out all these very private details about me very easily. The most surprising thing was I took a flight, which of course I had to take under my own name, but I did it in a way that I thought was pretty clever and people wouldn't know where I was going. And someone just called Delta or called a contact at Delta and got them to reveal my flight information, which they then published online while I was on the flight. Oh my gosh. That to me was a little mind blue. What did they say to Delta? Did they say like, oh, my brother forgot his medication and... I need to know when he's landing so I can give it to him. They never revealed it. They never revealed it. Or maybe someone at Delta was following the thing and like broke all protocols and and gave the information away. Like someone anonymously, basically anonymously published it online saying he's going here right now. Like you should go find him. That's pretty interesting. That could be a TV show. Did anyone approach you about doing that as a TV show? Yeah, they always wanted to do it as a reality show, which is not really my, my interest. Um, just sell the idea as a reality show because it was a reality show. You did it as a reality show, just documented with text yeah. instead of video. So I said like, yeah, if you can sell it, please sell it. I even went, went to LA, but that one never, nothing ever came with that one. Yeah. Nothing, nothing ever comes to anything whenever I go to LA. <laughs> Oh my gosh, I love these clothes. Mizzen and Main, that's M-I-Z-Z-E-N and Main. It really is the most comfortable work clothes. Travel clothes, I'm tra I am I had to travel this whole week. I'm traveling for a week and a half and I just took Mizzen and Main clothes with me. Close out 2023 in style with comfortable, breathable, packable, and machine washable pieces from Mizzen and Main. As you wrap up your year-end goals, enjoy a Mizzen and Main dress shirt you can wear confidently. I like that they've got very, very just nice, solid colors. I don't really like to get all fancy in patterns and everything, although they do have some pattern shirts, but very comfortable clothes, stretchable pants. It's just super comfortable, but they look professional and they, you can wear them casually or professionally. I like some of their flannel shirts are untucked shirts. I love untuck. I never tuck in. So again, uh, whether you're shopping for a special someone or giving yourself the gift you really want, 
I just buy myself gifts. Mizzen and Maine is the perfect gift for any guy who works, travels, and or cares about looking and feeling great. As you could tell by my many photos across the internet, I care about looking fantastic. I'm practically a model. And let's be honest, every guy loves to look great. So again, shop now at mizzenandmaine.com and save 20% when you spend $130 or more using promo code James, that's promo code James at Mizzen and Main, M I Z Z E N and Main.com. You know what I love about fantasy sports is that even though I'm not going to be a great basketball player or a baseball player or a football player or whatever, I feel like. I get to participate and make decisions and use my knowledge of these different leagues to, or these different sports to, to compete. So it's like I can pick my team or I can pick my favorite players and I could use my knowledge to make predictions and maybe even make money. So with the basketball season here, you can now pick combo projections across football and basketball from the specials league on prize picks. This is a league created specifically for combo projections that include two or more players from different sports or leagues. Want to play alongside some of Prize Picks' favorite players like rapper Meek Mill and comedian Andrew Schultz, who's also been a guest on this podcast and I've been a guest on his? You can now find community plays under the promos tab of the app to view entries for some of the biggest names in the Prize Picks community each week. Look, Prize Picks even offers a reboot policy so that your entries stay in play even if one of your players gets injured. For football and basketball games, if you have a player who exits the game in the first half and does not return in the second, that player is rebooted. Prize Picks is the only daily fantasy sports platform with an injury insurance policy. What? So I love playing it. I love anywhere where I can use analytical ability with my interests to demonstrate some skill and maybe make some money. And I like the game like aspect. I do wish they had chess as a category on prizepicks.com, but I'll set up for what they've got. Maybe I should make my own fantasy chess league. But in any case, I love prize picks. Go to prizepicks.com slash James. Use code James for a first deposit match up to $100. That's the easiest $100 you're ever going to make. So that's prizepicks.com slash James and use code James. Daily fantasy sports made easy. Nothing ever comes to anything whenever I go to LA, which brings us to even a much more exciting story. Your book, The Mastermind, it's unbelievable. I had never even heard of this guy. This is like the biggest criminal operation. This guy was like evil. And he started <laughs> off like, it seems like he started off not evil. Like, so do you want to describe real quickly in a nutshell who this guy is and what he did? And then I'm curious about the details. Yeah. So the main focus of the book is on a character named Paul LaRue. So Paul LaRue is a guy who was born in Zimbabwe, but back in the uh, 70s when it was actually called Rhodesia at the time. But he was born in Zimbabwe, he was raised partly in Zimbabwe, partly in South Africa. The funny thing is I used to often describe him as like the dark side Elon Musk. He was like the illicit startup mogul Elon Musk. But the people have such differing views, let's say, of Elon Musk now that it, it might, that might hit some people weird because they might say, is Elon Musk is the dark side Elon Musk. But in any case, uh, on the other side of the law, he essentially built an internet empire. So he actually is a programmer. He was in the classic mold of a startup founder. He got into computers when he was a teenager. He's a brilliant coder, no doubt. And he built encryption software. He actually built the foundation, what became a very famous piece of encryption software called TrueCrypt, which was a disk encryption software that he kind of built the precursor for. And then he started getting into more illicit endeavors. First, selling prescription painkillers over the internet. And he built an empire of hundreds of millions of dollars, at least doing that. In fact, in like 2008, 2009, he was probably making as much money as Facebook selling pills online. And then from there, he built that into a massive overall criminal cartel that was dealing in not just online pills, but also cocaine, methamphetamines, and many, many other illicit endeavors. 
And then even he was doing arms trafficking, like he sold arms to Iran. Yeah, he was trying to sell um, guidance systems for weapons to Iran, and he sold. He got, I think, five million dollars from them, and he was he was in the process of building it. He was building his own drones. He was trying to build a predator drone knockoff that he could sell. He was dealing with North Korea. He was trying to buy a submarine. He was dealing with the largest drug cartels in South America. I mean, he was really running like an all-purpose criminal empire that was mostly built and driven by the internet and by his technical prowess. There's a lot to understand there because, first off, his initial thing, the online prescriptions for painkillers, that was like gray area, legal, illegal, right? Like he would get your medical information, he would send it to a doctor, they would write the prescription, he would send it. So like, that's kind of legal, right? At the time, it was it operated in a legal gray area. So for one reason was that he was actually the medications that were his specialty, his his network, which was called RX Limited. They were painkillers, and one of them was a synthetic opioid, but they were not controlled substances. So the U.S. government did not consider them controlled substances, which meant you needed a prescription for them. But it wasn't quite like OxyContin or something like that, which was already a controlled substance. So essentially, the way the network worked is you'd go to a website and you'd say, "I want some." tramadol, which is a synthetic opioid, and they would say, okay, well, fill out this questionnaire. You fill out the questionnaire, that goes to a doctor in the U.S. who is signed up to do prescriptions. That doctor then fills out a prescription, which goes to a pharmacy in the U.S., which then sends you a FedEx package of your pills. All of this is happening within the United States. Paul LaRue is living in the Philippines, where he runs the whole operation from. And at the volume they were doing it, there was clearly something illegal about it. But in the specific transactions, it was difficult to figure out exactly what was illegal about what they were doing. What do you mean? Like, because of the volume, what made that illegal? Well, because at a certain point, if a doctor is doing one of these, I mean, it's basically telemedicine. Like, it's it's pretty common. And this was in, two, they started in like 2006, 2005, 2006, when it got really big. But nowadays, like, that kind of telemedicine is is relatively common. And so if one doctor writes you a prescription after a telemedicine visit, you would say, okay, well, you told the doctor you have back pain and the doctor looked at you over your Skype or Zoom connection or whatnot and gave you this prescription. But when the doctor is doing 150 prescriptions in an hour, you start thinking, well, okay, well, maybe the doctor's not paying that close attention to these questionnaires. And actually what the doctor is doing is a classic kind of pill mill, which is just writing scripts over and over, in this case, digitally, like uploading scripts. But then the doctor is doing something illegal. It's not so clear this guy, Paul uh, LaRue, was doing something illegal. Yeah, I mean, he's just creating the network that allows all of this to take place. He's just taking forms that were filled out and sending them to doctors. <laughs> yeah, basically. So they had a very difficult time. And in fact, in the end, the biggest pharmacist and doctor that they prosecuted who took it to trial, a lot of them took pleas because they thought they would lose, they won. They, they were found not guilty because they were not controlled substances. So there were not the same regulations around how you could prescribe them. Eventually, they made these drugs controlled substances. So that kind of ended the pill part of the empire in like 2012, 2013. By then... I mean, how much money do you think he made from just this gray area prescription business? It's very hard to tell because he was certainly operating outside of the bounds of any tax returns or lawsuits or legal remedies that would turn up like how much money he actually had. The DEA estimated around 2008, he was making as much as $250 million a year revenue selling prescription painkillers to Americans. For context, Facebook made like $272 million in 2008. So about on par with what Facebook was doing at the time. That's the DEA's estimate. They don't really know either. There were like 50 million doses that were going to Americans and they're kind of extrapolating back from that, from what they know and creating a model to kind of guess. That was their best guess was a couple hundred million dollars a year. And then the obvious question is, okay, so it's probably gonna at some point be illegal or maybe it already is illegal. He's gonna have to be on the run. Why not just stop then? Before there's a definitive word on whether he's committed a crime, no one's charging him with anything. Why not just stop, move to Switzerland or some other country without an extradition treaty and enjoy the rest of your life? I read about criminals a lot. This is the classic question for like a criminal who becomes head of a criminal organization, especially someone like Paul LaRue, who was not, he wasn't like born into the mafia or something. He wasn't raised in crime. Like he created this out of nothing. 
And in fact, his cousin was a source of mine. And his cousin would ask him this at the time. He would say, why don't you just quit? And part of what had happened was that he had gotten into these other illicit activities. So laundering money for drug cartels, operating with drug cartels where he's buying huge amounts of drugs and having shipped around the world. So he was like pretty leveraged. And he was leveraged against people who you do not just disappear with your money and refuse to pay them back. Like they will find you no matter where you are. But let's say, okay, let's say he paid them all back and he wound that down. Is is that allowed to happen? Like, can he, can you just say, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to handle these transactions anymore or they would have killed him because he knew too much. Well, maybe, I mean, he was certainly afraid that they would kill him. And given that he was also killing people, uh, he was he was existing in a world in which he was right to be afraid that there were people who were out to get him. So that was part of it. But by the time he was getting into the methamphetamines and, and cocaine and all the illicit drugs and then even worse stuff, he had already made significant amount of money just on prescription drugs. Yeah. So this is what this, this is what I always wonder is like, why did he take that next step? Like, did he did he have a goal like I'm going to be a billionaire and then I'm truly free? Like, did he like was he trying to fill some emptiness inside him and then that he thought that only and the number got greater and greater to to fill that emptiness? I'm I'm being psychobabble, but like what? What do you think it was having studied him for so long? Yeah, I mean, the short answer to that is yeah, is yes. I, I do think there is some version of that. I mean, I often turn it around and say, I don't know, why didn't Zuckerberg just retire after he made a billion dollars? Like, what's he trying to do? I have an answer for this because he was offered a billion dollars for Facebook shortly after it started. I think Microsoft made the offer and he turned it down. And the rest of the Facebook board wanted him to take it. So I asked Peter Thiel on this podcast, why did Mark Zuckerberg not take it. And Peter Thiel said he would have been worth $250 million and he was like 23 years old. And Mark Zuckerberg said, why should I take it? I'm just going to use his money to build another social network and I'm already doing that. So he just loved doing it. Yeah. But like with something that's illegal, there's some, an aspect of it that's scary. Like you, I'm sure I'm sure this guy, Paul Aru doesn't love being in jail and nobody, unless you're crazy, you don't think you're completely invincible from jail. So there was always that risk. And he was, he was at risk of getting killed too. Yeah, but he was, I mean, there is a parallel in that he was really good at it. And it was, he had a natural talent for it. And so he did think, he told people at certain points, like, I want to be the biggest criminal that ever lived. Like, I want to, like, if they ever arrest me, it will be on CNN. Like, I want it to be, to be huge. And there's a certain megalomania involved. There's a certain, you know, part of it is just straight greed. Like, he wanted it to get bigger and bigger and he wanted to make more money. And part of it is at his height, especially because he was living in the Philippines and he had bought and sold the police there and the judges and anyone who could get to him, like at his height, he did believe he was invincible. And by the time he kind of like started on a downhill where thing, he was trying to piece together new things and the money was a struggle, like then it was too late. Like at his height, he never thought I needed to get out. But by the time he thought he needed to get out, he couldn't get out. What made him good at it, do you think? Like, what quality of his personality? Well, I think he, in some ways, was able to detach himself from what he was doing. So he built it the way he had built a piece of software. Like, he tried to construct something that would work and that would generate money, but also when it came to, let's say, having to order people to commit violence in order to maintain certain parts of the business. Like he was clearly very unemotional about that. Like he very easily drifted into, okay, let's have this person killed. Let's have that person killed. This person seems like they're stealing money from me. Let's have them killed. Do you think he was always like that? Like, did you, you obviously talked to a lot of people like when he was younger, was he a nice guy? People liked him. People said he was a sweetheart. Something changed in his life when he found out that he was adopted. And a lot of people said that, you know, he had been raised by one family and then he found out pretty late in life, around age 30, that he had been adopted. And that was a real sort of like rupture in his life. And so people often brought that up. And then also he had built this piece of software called Encryption for the Masses, which was brilliant. And people said it was incredible, but it was open source and he never made any money on it. And something in that also seemed to affect him very, he saw these people getting rich building software, he had built this brilliant piece of software and he had been committed to the ideals of open source software. And then 
he felt like he was never compensated for it. Other people were trying to commercialize it. And then in his next, his next venture was online pills. His next venture was, okay, I'm going to find a way to take what I know and turn it into a money machine. And he was very successful at that. And then how did he make the leap into more illegal drugs? Like, just because I run an online pharmacy doesn't mean I could pick up the phone and call like all the drug cartels in the world. Like, how did he get in touch with other players in that business? I was amazed. He just tried things. Like, the real answer is he just tried. And he already had a lot of money. So one thing that really helped him was he, he started hiring security contractors many of whom had fought in Iraq and Afghanistan, and then they'd become these sort of gray world contractors being sent around to do all sorts of things. He hired some of them for security, and they had connections in darker worlds, so they could help him find people mm. who knew who had drugs and that sort of thing. But he also did things like just sent someone to Colombia, you know, just sent someone to walk around and say, hey, who here has a lot of cocaine that we could sell? Like that sort of thing. And you'd think it's ridiculous. And in some cases, those people like got beaten up and came home. But in other cases, they connected with someone who connected with someone. And when they got in a room, they could say, my boss will wire you a million dollars today. And if you have that ability, people take you seriously. Mm. And of course, people probably suspected that he might be law enforcement or something else. But if you get deep enough into it, and you're willing to provide the money and ship the drugs, one leads to another and people start taking you seriously. He did the same thing in Iran. He just sent a guy to Iran to try to find contacts to sell weapons. And the guy did, the Filipino guy. I mean, that seems so crazy though, to even go from, like it seemed crazy to go from like prescription drugs to amphetamines, but then to go from like drugs to arms to Iran, like it's almost like he's trying to tease the government into, hey, I'm just gonna keep getting away with this unless you catch me. Unless you know, here yeah, I am, well, like, notice me. <laughs> and, and eventually he did. This is such a valuable service for all business owners, big businesses, small businesses, doesn't matter. I wish I had this in the many different businesses that I've started. Sometimes it seems like your business is humming, but then suddenly you don't understand it. You're starting to fall behind. You're not understanding what where your costs are, where your revenues are, where where your payments are. Teams are buried in all sorts of like BS work and you can't seem to close the books. So you need like one dashboard, one source of truth. I'm jealous of this business, NetSuite from Oracle, of course, NetSuite by Oracle. I wish I'd come up with this idea. It's, it's, it's a brilliant concept to have all your business intelligence on one dashboard. This is why you need to know these three numbers, 37,000, 25, and one. So 37,000, that's the number of businesses which have upgraded to NetSuite by Oracle. NetSuite is the number one cloud financial system, streamlining accounting, financial management, inventory, HR, and more. 25, NetSuite turns 25 this year. That's 25 years of helping businesses do more with less, close their books in days, not weeks, and drive down costs. One, because your business is one of a kind. So you get a customized solution for all of your key performance indicators, your KPIs, in one efficient system with one source of truth. Manage risk, get reliable forecasts, and improve margins. Everything you need to grow all in one place. So right now, Download NetSuite's popular KPI checklist designed to give you consistently excellent performance absolutely free at netsuite.com slash James. That's netsuite.com slash James to get your own KPI checklist. netsuite.com slash James. The future of learning is definitely online. Like it's such BS that you have to spend $200,000 or take $200,000 in loans and go to some fancy school when it's useless. It doesn't guarantee you a job. Most employers, including me, do not care about degrees or grades or anything like that. We want to care that you love what you're doing, that you know what you're doing, in some cases that you have experience or that you're willing to learn. But 
people in general love learning and are curious. Like the key to success is curiosity. And I think masterclass.com is the perfect model for online learning. I'm really happy they're, they're sponsoring uh, this episode. If you're going to give a gift, give the gift of learning. Masterclass makes a meaningful gift this season for you and anyone on your list because both of you can learn from the best to become your best from leadership to effective communication to cooking. Let me tell you some of the classes I've taken. I've taken comedy from Steve Martin. I mean, can you believe I can take a class from Steve Martin on comedy or Judd Apatow, my favorite comedy director. I could take an actual class from him on writing. Wolfgang Puck on cooking. Dan Brown on writing. Or Judy Bloom, who's been on this podcast, on writing. By the way, Wolfgang Puck also has been on this podcast. It's such a pleasure. I, I try to take classes all the time from masterclass.com. And whether you're watching Masterclass on TV or listening in audio mode in the app or on their site, the quality speaks for itself. It's like these Masterclass instructors are your own personal mentors that are going to help you reach the next level. How much would it cost to take one-on-one -on -one classes on comedy from Steve Martin or on chess from Gary Kasparov? You just wouldn't be able to do it. But it would, I mean, it would cost hundreds of thousands of dollars. With a Masterclass annual membership, it's $10 a month. Memberships start at $120 a year for unlimited access to one-on-one -on -one classes with all 180 plus masterclass instructors. So it's not just $120 for one instructor. You get all 180 plus masterclass instructors. Boost your confidence and find practical takeaways you can apply to your life and at work. And if you own a business or are a team leader, use Masterclass to empower and create future-ready employees and leaders. That's the real education in today's world. So this holiday season, you can give one annual membership and get one free at masterclass.com slash JAS. JAS, of course, stands for the James Altucher Show. So right now you can get two memberships for the price of one at masterclass.com slash JAS. Masterclass.com slash JAS. Offer terms apply. You know, again, so would people just go online to one of his websites and say, oh, yeah, I'd love some crystal meth. Uh, please send it to this address. And that's what he would do. Like, how did he stay online? No, that was a wholesale business. So, like, the online business was strictly a pill business. Mm -hmm. So he was not selling, like, cocaine and meth online. The cocaine and meth he was doing in a very traditional way, which was he was buying 50 kilos or 100 kilos from someone in Peru, putting it on a yacht or sailboat yacht and like sending it across the Pacific to then sell on the streets in Australia, just like a regular drug cartel. He was just becoming a middleman for a lot of cartels to move drugs from one place to another. He was developing his own fleet of drones, both airborne and underwater as ways to move regular drugs. So that stuff was not online. It was using his technical prowess because he always was hiring engineers to come in and try to figure out new ways of doing things. But it wasn't actually, that was not an online business. The online business was just pills. And when he started getting into this, like, did the people who were already selling lots of drugs to, let's say, Australia, using your example, did they get pissed off? Like, who's this new guy? We need to kill him? Well, I'm sure he had people who, yes, who wanted to kill him, for sure. But I think he was providing, in the cases where he hooked up with people, he was providing a sort of valuable service, but also keeping himself removed from, he didn't have a crew of people on the streets selling drugs. So he wasn't, you know, necessarily competing with people. He was sort of providing new routes almost for people to supply drugs from one place to another, which is something they needed. You know, he's almost like the guts of the supply chain was, I think, more his goal than rather than running like an end to end situation. You know, and you describe all of this like masterfully in the book, the book's like a must read, but what started to cause him to fall apart? It seems like the more killing he did, the more likely it was he was falling apart. Yeah, he was definitely started coming apart in like 2010. He became extremely paranoid about people in his own organization stealing from him. That's when the worst of the violence happened. He had his right-hand man, this guy named Dave Smith, who was an ex-British military guy who was like head at all of his security contracting. He had him killed. He actually was there when he was killed, helped kill him. And then... He developed a hit list and he had his hit list people who had stolen like a thousand dollars from him, allegedly. Like someone told him someone skimmed a thousand dollars. I mean, this is a guy, he's making hundreds of millions of dollars. 
to having someone killed over a thousand dollars. So clearly he had his brain had broken when it came to like the paranoia that was probably necessary to run the business, but had gotten out of control. And then, like I said, the government scheduled these substances. They the US government made them controlled substances, which made his business very, very difficult, his online business. And so the money just wasn't there anymore. Credit card processors wouldn't process the transactions anymore. And so his money was growing thin. He had debts. He's got he's leveraged against drug cartels. He moved his business from the Philippines to Brazil because he'd gotten tipped off that the US government was going to come into the Philippines and maybe pick him up. So then he was in Brazil. Then he was being surveilled in Brazil. And then eventually the US government kind of lured him into a sting operation where he thought that he was dealing with these drug cartels, the South American drug cartel, but in Liberia, but they were waiting for him there and they caught him there. And when you say leveraged against the cartels, like what, what does that mean? Like he was borrowing, who was he borrowing from? Like what was he borrowing? I mean, like he's spending, you know, $50 million on a cocaine shipment and then you've got to get it delivered to Australia and then sold to someone there in order to get your money back. So you can't just say like, okay, let's pause all of this because my other business is not doing very well and I might not have the full 50 million for you. Like you've made deals about what you're going to get and where it's going to go. And then you're going to try to sell it. You're going to make a little profit on it. So he's like in the middle of a very transaction heavy business where his source of capital, his main source of capital to get into that business was the online pill company. So you could think of it like if you had a company that was very successful and then you start saying, okay, well, we're going to buy other companies or invest in other companies and you've got all these deals working, you've signed all these this paperwork and then suddenly your main company's revenues dry up. Now you've got, you've signed all these papers, but you don't have the money to pay for it. Except in this case, the people that you're supposed to be paying will kill you if you don't pay them. Okay, so he's he's running low on cash. Now, could he have disappeared? We talked about this a little before, but would it have been possible for him, given all the, the high level of criminal masterminds he was probably dealing with, it probably would have been much harder for him to disappear, but could he have done it? Yeah. Like if you were him, given your experience with Vanished, what would you do? He certainly could have done it. He had the resources. In fact, he used to keep a lot of his money in gold. So he had huge stashes of gold. A lot of people believe there are still large stashes of buried gold in the Philippines of his. I mean, it's not that easy to carry around, but he certainly had access to cash that was outside the banking system. He had contacts all over the world. In fact, he had bought properties in places with a specific idea that he would escape there. He had bought, I think he was looking at property in Vietnam. He was looking, and he even he had moved to Brazil for this very reason, the, the extradition uh, idea and, and it, in, that he couldn't be extradited from Brazil. He even had a Brazilian child intentionally because he believed it would make it harder for him to be extradited from Brazil. Um, he paid a woman to have his child, essentially. Um, so he was actually like working the angles. Uh, the only problem was he didn't go all the way. He didn't say, I'm quitting the business and I'm just going to start some new life. He moved to a country like that and then he wanted to restart the business and he needed money and there was this big drug deal that looked like it would get him that money. And so that's why he left Brazil, went to Liberia, which they have no trouble getting him out of once they arrest him. And now he's in jail. He was sentenced to what, 20 years, 25 years, something like that. Yeah. He wasn't sentenced to life, even though he was involved in all these murders. Yeah, because he cooperated. But still, cooperation, I mean, he, who, who got who got it worse than him in terms of sentencing? Like he was involved in like a dozen murders or more. Yeah, it's a very strange situation. It's a strange legal situation, which I get into in the book where, you know, normally if you see, even if you see like a cop show on TV or something, like what normally they try to do is infiltrate a criminal organization from the bottom up or at least from the middle up. You know, you're, you're trying to get people to flip. You either arrest them or you get them to be informants for you so you can get to the top of the organization. Well, Paul LaRue was the top of the organization. And they arrested him. And then what they did was they worked their way down. So they tried to get all the people below him, including former U.S. military, uh, former U.S. Army uh, soldiers who had worked for him, who had committed hits for him. And so he was cooperating with them. They got the people that he had ordered to commit murders. He testified against those people and they got life in prison. And he got a couple decades in prison minus the time that he's already served. And so for his cooperation, he got time off for his cooperation, 
because he was never really charged for murder. Like he admitted to the murders, he ordered the murders, but he never char- he was never charged with them. And I guess like, can he get off for of good behavior like in 10 years? Like what's the story there? Like when's he gonna actually be out? No, not in the federal system. So he's in federal prison. He actually just lost his appeal. He had appealed an adjustment to his sentence, which he lost or a resentencing. So he'll be in for another decade or more. But then, I mean, his potentially bigger problem is that once he's out, the Philippines wants him. So the Philippines would like to prosecute him there, which is where the murders took place. Like most of the murders took place in the Philippines. So they are very much interested in getting him to the Philippines. And so if they were able to do that, now there's a question. Previously, he bought his way out of a lot of criminal cases in the Philippines, but perhaps now he wouldn't be able to. And then if he's going to choose between spending life in prison here or in the Philippines, uh, he would certainly choose here. I mean, I'm sure he'd rather be free in, in any case. Have you tried to visit him in prison? I haven't. I've tried to contact him different ways. I mean, I've, obviously, over the course, I was reporting the book for five years. I tried many ways to talk to him. He, I mean, I think smartly during the course of his case, his lawyers would never let him speak to me. But he did testify at great length about all of this. And he he had a admitted to it. So he basically told the story of his own rise and fall on the witness stand over the course of three days and in other documents. But I was never able to talk to him. I will probably send him another letter soon. Like I'm always trying to figure out maybe after his appeal is over, he'll want to talk or it'll be safer to talk or he'll get bored. Now, it seems like someone must have published you about the optioning the movie rights for this because this is like a great movie. Uh, Yes. Yes. They have optioned the rights for it. Do you think they'll make it? I don't know. I try to, the, I've optioned other things in the past and it's a real crapshoot where the right people have to be involved at the right time and have the right budget. I let them do their thing and I don't mess with it. And I try not to ask questions except when it needs to be re-optioned and then, then I'm happy to re-engage with them. So I try not to get too optimistic that anyone's ever going to do it because most things do not get made, but also to enjoy it. It's fun when a thing's at you know HBO or Amazon or whatnot and yeah. like, people are working on it and they're trying to develop the story. And now um, you do a podcast called Persona. Can you describe that? Yeah, Persona is a new show that I just launched this summer. It's an investigative podcast, so it's one story over eight episodes about a French-Israeli scammer named Gilbert Shikley, who I think is like, he's not the biggest money-wise scammer of the 21st century, but I think he's the, the pioneering scammer of the 21st century. I think his scams have given us many of the largest scams that exist today are modeled off of what he created. So it's eight episodes covering an initial scam he did, and then another one 10 years later, and everything that happened in between, and how he got caught, how he escaped, and the ins and outs of how we live in a kind of scam-rich world these days and where that came from. Now, can you come back on the podcast in a couple of weeks and talk about Persona? Well, Because we'll, Persona is eight episodes, so obviously you can't give the whole story, but can we talk yes. about the story on uh, and promote Persona? That'd be great. I would be happy to. Yeah, there's two more episodes to coming out. At six are out. Actually, seven's out this morning, and there's one more next week. And so after that, I can talk about everything. Excellent. Well, Evan Ratliff, if people want to read more about uh, Paul LaRue, they, you wrote the book, The Mastermind, and it's like, I can't even believe this is better than any throw. I can't even believe all the stuff this guy did. And there, there's so much more. I mean, thank you for describing the story like you did, but this is, there's a lot of things this guy did. And, uh, and it's kind of just interesting to, to analyze like who this person is and, and what his choices were and why he made certain choices and so on. But thanks for talking about that. Looking forward to talking about persona. Love talking about your your theories on Twitter. <laughs> and uh, let's definitely schedule your, your next time on. But, but thanks very much for coming on. Hey, my pleasure. Grandma, can I have the chocolate chips? This secret recipe moment made possible by Emory Heart and Vascular Center. When Grandma needed heart care, she came to Emory. The difference? Emory Healthcare performs more heart procedures annually than anyone else in Georgia, which means better outcomes for our patients. And we offer advanced and personalized treatments developed by our top specialists that others don't. Like Grandma knows, where you start your heart care matters. Smart cookie. EmoryHealthcare.org slash smart cookie. Whether in person or remote, open communication with your doctor is key to managing any condition, including heart failure. How have you been feeling? 
Um, I'm okay. Both are great options to continue having open conversations with your doctor about how you're feeling. I've had less energy. And when you speak openly with your doctor, they're better equipped to help. Visit heartfailuretalks.com to learn more.